Hey, how you doing? This is Corporal Brenner, United States Marine Corps, with K-9 Grief. Over here at Cop Azizula in beautiful Afghanistan. The weather is hot and it's getting cool. I want to shout out to all of you who are watching this. I'm not sure who's going to see it. But most importantly, to my wife, Megan, back home, coming home soon. Love you all. Stay safe. We thought his name was something else. We thought his name was, like, like I said, Grife or Griff. It was grief, and uh, it is the worst dog name ever. Alfred, as a youngster, was too good. He actually never caused any trouble. He was a kid who did really well in school, and so I figured He's going to go off to college. He's going to, you know, could be business, could be whatever, because he was smart. He could do whatever he wanted. I uh, never thought I'd do this, but I never got to make it to college. I was a shock. Comes home and says, I'm going to join the Marine Corps. I decided that college was too darn expensive. Unfortunately, I had no idea what I wanted to study. Everyone kind of had an idea, but at 17, 18, we have absolutely no clue. Uh, I was not amazing at anything, but good at everything. I wound up uh, talking to a recruiter because of the fact that they could pay for college and help with transportation from my yard all over the world. I wanted to leave home, travel a little bit before it was too late. I said, okay, if that's what you want to do, no problem. I met grief through being attached to the kennel. So what we do is once we graduate K-9 school, we get sent to our duty station. Our jobs are to train every single day and then go overseas. Unfortunately, when I got there, I didn't have a dog. All of a sudden, these three dogs came in and it was Vicky, Grief, and Troy. Grief was this big dog, black, wouldn't move, wouldn't talk, and I was just like, look, I gotta take Grief. And from that point on, you're paired with the dog and then you become a dog team. Your job is to brush him, groom him, play with him, and most importantly, train him. He was a stubborn German Shepherd. The very first time that I knew we would have problems is when I threw him the Kong, which was his toy. And when he got it, he didn't come back. So I knew right away, I was just like, this is gonna be a long road. Probably took about two years until we finally got to a point where it was, you know, just that it just clicks. It happened when we went to Afghanistan. And I wish it happened sooner because I would have felt way more comfortable going into war with a dog that I have to trust every single day. Uh, but when we got there, it was September, so it got a little cool, and it was really the icing on the cake. You know, we've had certain moments, but this was the moment where I knew this bond was 100% complete. It's because he never actually wanted to cuddle with me. You know, he wasn't like your normal dog, normal golden, where he just kind of like cuddled on the couch, and I always wanted that for him. He was just a killer, straight killer. So finally, it was real cold. I got him up in my cot, and I held him as hard as I could just so I can keep warm because it literally just dropped from like 80 to 50 at night. So I held him really tight, thinking he tried to get off and he didn't move at all and he kind of like snuggled in a little bit and when he hit my chin I was like almost wanted to cry but it was more just a relief of joy being like wow this was the moment where we were made to be together and then after that it was just you know every day it's almost like we just were connected. It was the last mission we did we were told to wait there against the wall sit relax until they blew it up they would do a controlled detonation and they would just set off the bomb. Uh, so I sat there with grief. I was just sitting there against the wall. He was sitting there just hanging out with me. I was petting him and there was this kid right next to me. His name was Steven. And as we were sitting there talking, he was petting my dog. And I just remember just seeing his face light up because he was able to escape where he was. You know, that's what the dogs do. That's the power of the dogs. They're able to just kind of break you out of your present state of mind and you just focus on every second that's happening now because you're focusing on that dog. It's just a, it's an, a surreal experience, but people who love dogs know what I'm talking about. You know, I wish I spent more energy talking to him because uh, right before we were told to get up, they said, all right, you know, we got two minutes. Let's take a step back, get to a safer distance because they're about to blow his ID. So I went to stand up and I went to grab grief stuff, packed everything up. And then when I went and put his stuff on, I turned around to the left and started walking away. But after about two seconds, an explosion went off, and it was way too close and too soon for it to be the one that they were going to do a controlled detonation. Uh, so I turn around, and I see uh, Grief's retractable leash. It was missing into this cloud of smoke. I remember just seeing nothing, and I started pulling, and I was calling Grief's name. You know, I'm just a little frantic. So I'm pulling and pulling and pulling, and all of a sudden, he, I see him standing there like this, just locked up. 
So I'm kicking and he's walking back and forth. And I kind of just did like a spiral just to clear this area. And as I come around for the last time, uh, I look up and I see these two guys on top of this building. And they were actually taking down Steven, who was sitting on top of an IED, who was blown up right before I went to walk away. Uh, that, when I saw that sight, it was something that I'll never forget. All I could think about was him talking. I could just think about the last thing he said to me. What is the last memory I have of grief? <sighs> Well, it's tough because the last memory I have of grief would be um, the fact that I was uh, blown up with him. We wound up walking around this building. I did a perimeter search. Uh, with me, I had the um, captain of the unit I was with, the sergeant major, uh, their medic, and four, I, a, or the Afghan army. We got to this building, and around the back door, I found a smaller door, also locked. Uh, all surrounded by mud and this uh, sergeant major I was with said you know what I can definitely get over this wall no problem he uh, gave me his rifle because he felt it was easier to climb over the wall he hopped over and he vanished so now he's in an unsecured building trying to clear it himself and I'm again just standing there fried I'm like I, I have no idea how this is gonna end the captain I was with winds up going up to the door that was there which was locked and he says hold my rifle so he hands me his rifle and we started uh, talking a little bit and he's like, oh, I'm going to rip the door down. And I said, sir, you know, I don't advise you to do that. But if you want to just try to like peek into that little hole to see if you can see anything inside. Just see if you see wires, pots, you know, jugs, anything that might be booby trapped. Uh, so he looked and he told me that he uh, sees jugs. He sees a couple of things sitting outside the door. And I, I was like, OK, well, go ahead and rip the door down. But let me take a couple steps back. So now I have three rifles including my own, a pistol and a dog. I just standing there waiting and all of a sudden he starts yanking on this door and ripping it down and the Afghans we were with were getting so upset. So I had a camera, took the camera out, took a picture of the door. He starts going to work, starts peeling the mud down and he starts yanking on this door as hard as he could. And then all of a sudden, bam, door falls down, laying on the ground. I'm looking right into this doorway and there's these three jugs right there and I'm just like watching them as if, they should have gone off. And I just was thinking to myself, this might be it. Like, it, I don't know what we got ourselves into now. <laughs> After I started to regain my thoughts, coming around the corner was the Sergeant Major that hopped into the wall. He somehow made it through, got out the front door, and now he comes around. So I wanted to walk back to give him his rifle. And before I took my third step, uh, I felt like I immediately started flying through the air. Everything went white. Uh, I tell kids all the time, it's like if you were in the summertime and you shut your eyes and looked up at the sun. And I felt like I was flipping through the air probably, you know, 20, 30 times, just floating. And I heard this high-pitched squealing sound. Uh, when the bomb went off, I wound up, you know, not being able to see, and I'm not sure exactly why. I did have scrapes and shrapnel wounds to my face. I'll be honest, I thought I was dead. The first thought I had was, I am 100% dead. I'm floating up to heaven. This is the little trumpet that's getting tuned up, you know, getting me there. And uh, that started to go away, and I heard the sound of voices. You know, halfway through then putting Humpty Dumpty back together, um, I knew that something else was going on because the fact that how was I the only one that got hurt? There had to have been someone else that got hurt. Uh, nobody was calling his name. Nobody was, you know, saying, grief come. It, you know, there wasn't a... Uh, any talk about his injuries or what is going on with him. So at that moment, I knew immediately that he was killed. It was the first time that I heard familiar faces or familiar voices again. You know, Chris Willingham, he uh, just retired, but he was there and he wound up saying, okay, I'll call her for you. So they get on the phone and they wound up calling my wife. So we were out celebrating my birthday. My birthday's on October 25th. Al got blown up technically October 24th. So by the time, with the time difference, and he was being flown to Germany, we found out about it, and uh, we were all together, which was good, with his wife, my wife, uh, my other kids, we were all together celebrating my birthday. To hear about that later on, it made me feel comfortable because I knew that everything was lining up. I didn't mean, I didn't have to explain it to mom and dad, and it kind of gave me a sense of relief, like I'm gonna be fine because of the love and support I have for my family. The biggest problem was it was probably two weeks after the fact we were in the hospital and I just came out of surgery 
it was like a couple days after I got the greatest gift ever, which was an iPad, and all I could do was move my finger. So I was going through, and one of my buddies who I deployed with, he posted something on Facebook about grief, and it was a picture of me and him, and it just brought back these feelings of, like, this was my guy. Like, every day, we had great memories, and it just, that's what really hit me. Like, I don't have that anymore. So that was the hardest, hardest part. I tell people all the time, blowing up is easy. It happens like this. You don't feel anything, but losing somebody that definitely had no choice to be there, he was just doing his job, that's what hurt me the most. I broke down crying. I was just started tearing up, and the whole room knew right away. I mean, it was like it's a normal thing, and it's just extremely normal. You're supposed to break it down, and that's, I think, helped me kind of process the beginning of the grief stage, I guess you can say. In this situation, when Al lost his dog, we don't understand how serious that was because um, it's almost, it would be like if you had a child or a best friend, more like a best friend, who you live with and you experienced a whole bunch of things with, and then that person died. I was very surprised and taken back by his positive attitude. And I'm here to tell you, it was very impressive to see a young man, less than 20 years old, encounter what he encountered and have the positive attitude that he had for what he experienced. So Al's buddy was his dog. And so he lived with the dog, he slept with the dog, he ate with the dog, and that was, he talked to the dog. I'm sure he talked to the dog and maybe the dog answered him, I don't know, but um, that was his friend, that was his companion. So it's not like he trained a dog and lost a dog. He trained and worked with a person, it was like a person, and then lost it. All right, so it's October 24, 2018, and today is my live day. Uh, but incidentally, we call it Grief Day because of grief. On Grief Day, I like to celebrate grief's life, but it's kind of fun because it was in memory of grief. I mean, it's all because of grief. So uh, most guys, when they get hurt, they call it a live day. That's what it's called and known throughout the wounded warrior community. But uh, today, for me, it's Grief Day. You know, and we've done our grieving. You know, we've moved on, and now it's just Yay! celebrating his life. The fact that we grew up together and learned everything together, you know, was the best. And I couldn't have asked for anything different. I'm a firm believer in everything happens for a reason. You know, one thing happens and then all of a sudden you wake up the next day and your career path has changed. And if you don't accept it, you'll wind up spinning in circles. So I really just look at everything every day as just like I'm getting pushed in the right direction. And I think grief helped me do that. I just chose weather. Just <laughs> It's still a horrible dog name. It's a, uh, an emotion. Um, it's part of life. It's, it's, it has nothing to do with dogs, but it has everything to do with war. And it made so much sense to be able to, I mean, wrap it in. It just, when I had him, I was like, this is a horrible dog name. But then when he was killed, his legacy just almost made sense. He's definitely the one that I give my life to. Yes, 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 yes. Oh.